Hey guys, today we are going to travel down another rabbit hole into the realm of moon landing deniers. This video titled NASA admits we never went to the moon by YouTube user Better Mankind was referred to me by one of my subscribers and I felt like this was a good video for me to start debunking these idiots and their idiotic claims. So let's begin. Hi everyone and welcome to yet another controversial Better Mankind video. I think subconsciously there must be a part of me that enjoys the onslaught of nasty comments when I make videos like this. But the fact remains that there's way more evidence that supports the theory that we never went to the moon than there is to support that we ever did. As a skeptic, I have always withheld a belief as to whether we did or did not go to the moon. I simply had never researched it. But after doing my own research, I can confidently say that we did, in fact, go to the moon. Simply put, the amount of evidence to support the validity of the moon missions completely outweighs the totality of evidence that supports the notion that we did not go to the moon. The majority of the evidence against man going to the moon is either all circumstantial or due to a misunderstanding of the laws of physics. However, the third party verified evidence that supports man's mission to the moon is overwhelming. I won't cover them all in this video as I intend on debunking more moon landing denier videos in the future. Now there are many reasons that prove we never went to the moon. To mention a few, you have the wavy flag in a zero atmosphere environment. This is probably one of the easier arguments to dismiss. When the flag was unrolled and put into the ground, the vibrations rippled up the pole and through the fabric, and the fabric would wave due to the conservation of momentum. On Earth, the atmosphere would prevent a flag from waving due to the vibrations traveling up the pole. However, on the moon, there is simply not enough atmosphere to prevent the flag from expressing these vibrations in a waving motion. This animation is an accurate representation of how a flag can wave in zero atmosphere and looks very similar to the actual flag waving in the Apollo video. The lack of any blast crater underneath the lunar module. The lack of a blast crater on the lunar surface has two very basic explanations. First, due to the lack of atmosphere, the exhaust of the lander would dissipate more to the sides of the engine than it would here in Earth's thicker atmosphere, which directs most of the rocket exhaust straight down and the reduced gravity would have required the lander to use less thrust than necessary on Earth when descending, only approximately 3,000 to 3,500 pounds of thrust. Second, the site they landed on was essentially a really large rock. Photos of the lunar landing site reveal how the dust directly underneath the lunar lander was pushed to the outside of the landing zone where it formed a circular dust ring. There are just too many viable scientific explanations as to why there is no blast crater under the lander for this to be considered proof of anything. Or how about the absence of stars in space? This statement shows either his intent to deceive or his complete lack of basic knowledge. The stars are there. Simply turn the exposure up on the camera and they will appear. However, the more important objects in this picture, the Earth and the Moon, would appear to be completely bright white blobs. I will side with NASA on this one, that the Earth and the Moon in the picture are more important than the distant stars. The problem with any of these arguments is that NASA seems to have an explanation for every single one of them. I don't get it, so what's the problem? If every piece of evidence that you have can be completely explained away by the natural laws of physics, then you have no evidence and your hypothesis is wrong. I can understand that a story about the government lying to its people about a moon landing is a great conspiracy theory, but with Without verifiable evidence, it's nothing more than just a theory. Therefore, people like me and other moon landing deniers are referred to as a bunch of crazy tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy kooks that need to up their medication. I agree. The lot of you are a bunch of crazy, tinfoil hat wearing, delusional, paranoid, conspiratard idiots who definitely need an increase in the dose of your medication. So in this video, I'm only going to address a single discrepancy that NASA themselves have admitted to on more than one occasion and will prove without a doubt that we have never even left low Earth orbit, let alone landed a man on the moon. But first, let's go back to school and get a refresher course on the different atmospheres surrounding the Earth. Now, the following information is critical to proving my point, so please bear with me. The following information he provides has some actual scientific value. Therefore, I'm just going to let it play all the way through before I stop it. 
First we have the troposphere. This is where all of our weather occurs and it is the lowest layer of the Earth's atmosphere. It starts at the Earth's surface and extends up to a height of 4 to 10 miles. Next we have the stratosphere which extends to about 35 miles above the Earth's surface. This is where our ozone layer resides and protects us from those dangerous UV rays. It is also the layer where aircraft travels as it is free from weather disturbances. Now we go up to the mesosphere where most meteors burn up on entry. The mesosphere stretches up to 50 miles above the Earth's surface. Next we have the thermosphere and this layer extends up to 400 miles from the Earth's surface and the air here is very thin. Also temperatures here start to get really hot ranging anywhere from 200 to 500 degrees Celsius and 500 to 2000 degrees Celsius in the upper region. And last but not least is the exosphere. The temperature in the exosphere can vary from 0 to 1700 degrees Celsius. The exosphere is the outermost layer of the Earth's atmosphere and is around 6,200 miles from the Earth's surface. Now according to NASA, low Earth orbit is around 1,200 miles from the Earth's surface. You are an idiot, as this is factually incorrect. They didn't get this information from NASA, they got it from Wikipedia, and they didn't even finish reading the whole sentence. It states that low Earth orbit is any orbit that is 1,200 miles or less, and NASA officially considers low Earth orbit to be any orbit from 100 to 1,200 miles above the Earth's surface. So before I tell you the reasons why it is impossible for us to go beyond the exosphere, or for that matter even past the thermosphere, have a listen to what some NASA experts have to say about this topic. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Hang on, hang on. So what you're saying is that in order to send humans through this region, we need to solve the challenge of getting through the Van Allen radiation belts. Uh, but I'm confused. Didn't you already solve this challenge back in 1969 when you sent astronauts to the moon and subsequently five other times after that? I swear, the phrase, what you are saying is, is the perfect lead in to every straw man fallacy ever. No, that is not what he is saying. While the Orion spacecraft gets its technological and structural heritage from the Apollo spacecraft, they are in fact two completely different spacecraft with completely different equipment. And the man speaking in this video, Kelly Smith, is talking only about the Orion spacecraft and its ability to shield the astronauts and instrumentation from the harmful radiation in space. But we're also really pushing the boundaries in terms of where we're going forward with exploration. I think uh, humans are naturally driven to do this. And this is really the beginning, I think, of human beings leaving low Earth orbit. I certainly plan on being around to see that. So she's a NASA astronaut, but I guess no one bothered to tell her about the first time that we left low Earth orbit. I guess she might be a little too young to remember. And you might just be an idiot. This is another straw man, as it is obvious that she wasn't saying that we have never been past low Earth orbit. You don't know the context of the question asked, and you aren't even considering the possibility that under the stress of a live interview from space, you might just misspeak or get one or two details wrong. Here we have another astronaut that wasn't told about the moon landing 48 years ago. Uh, the plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is that is much bigger than what we have today, and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, be, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. We only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to and we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. And yet another straw man. He was obviously talking about the current technology used in the space program today, which is designed for low Earth orbit. For them to get past low Earth orbit means upgrading the current machinery to at least the protection level the instrumentation and astronauts had for Apollo. 
once we, once we travel beyond low Earth orbit, the crew will be exposed to larger amounts of radiation. So we have to design both the crew protection systems and our electronic systems to withstand this radiation. So that would mean that Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin were a tough bunch of SOBs able to withstand all that brutal radiation considering these challenges are still yet to be solved. This dipshit is doing his best to build a straw man army. As stated before, the current technology used in space today is not designed to go beyond low Earth orbit. While the astronauts themselves would be protected with the shielding technology from Apollo, today's instrumentation is just too sensitive and would need additional shielding for them to operate properly. It becomes more apparent how weak a person's argument is when they turn to using logical fallacies instead of evidence. Well, I managed to find a very clever and well-informed astronaut that will totally straighten things out for us and explain exactly why we're not able to return to the moon uh, and break through those Van Allen radiation belts. Have a listen to this clever chap. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and it's a painful process to build it back again. This guy, oh boy. He's a real life example of what can happen to you when you're exposed to all of that outer space radiation. Oh, so now we're on to ad hominem fallacies. What gives you the moral or intellectual authority to judge this man's intelligence? There's more knowledge in his irradiated brain cells than you have in the past four generations of subhuman monkeys that are responsible for spawning you combined. You are an idiot. And if you're a child with aspirations of becoming an astronaut, being a very good liar might be a positive attribute to have on your resume. For those of you that don't know, people like this are the reason that I make the content that I do. What kind of piece of shit addresses children to dissuade them from pursuing one of the most prestigious jobs in the world? I can't fucking stand idiots like him. Do the world a favor and drink bleach for a living. Now just by showing you these admissions of guilt by NASA, I can easily end this video now and I would have easily proven my point without a shadow of a doubt. But I'm sure that for some of you hardened skeptics out there, I believe he's talking about people like me, but I'm sure his definition of a hardened skeptic could easily be applied to anyone who practices critical thinking and healthy skepticism. This damaging evidence is still not enough. Yeah, right. Your misrepresentation and quote mining of the astronauts and engineers only shows how dishonest you are, and by no means is anything close to evidence. An admission of guilt would consist of an astronaut or high-level NASA employee specifically saying, we never went to the moon. You find that footage and you can stop with your fallacious claims. So let's take this theory of mine to the next level. This here is the lunar module now proudly displayed at the National Air and Space Museum. According to NASA, the primary materials used to build the module were aluminium alloy, stainless steel, titanium, nickel steel alloy, heat resistant glass. Now if this is the case we have a very serious discrepancy here. If you remember earlier when I went through the different atmospheres that surround the Earth, both the thermosphere and exosphere have temperatures ranging from 0 to 2000 degrees Celsius. And yet another idiot that doesn't understand the difference between temperature and heat. Roughly explain, temperature is the average amount of heat contained in each individual molecule in a system, and heat is a summation of the energy of all the molecules in a system. This animation represents the difference between the temperature and heat of the denser atmosphere around the surface of the Earth and the less dense atmosphere of the thermosphere. If the temperature of both systems are the same, then the individual molecules will have the same amount of energy, but the heat of the thicker surface atmosphere would be greater than that of the thermosphere. For being a science denier, you definitely don't understand the science that you are denying. So I decided to examine the melting points of the primary metals that were used to build the lunar module. First off we have the aluminium alloy which has a melting point of 463 degrees Celsius. Next we have stainless steel which has a melting point of 1510 degrees Celsius. Then we also have nickel steel alloy which melts at 1453 degrees Celsius and of course the heat resistant glass for the windows which has a melting point of 760 degrees Celsius. So this would mean that the lunar module along with its occupants would have disintegrated well before it even passed through the thermosphere 
let alone surviving the Van Allen radiation belts in the exosphere. The idea that the Apollo spacecraft would burn up and disintegrate in the thermosphere and exosphere is ridiculous. Consider this example. If you were to boil water at 100 degrees Celsius and stick your hand in it, it would do more damage to your skin than if you stuck your hand in a 100 degrees Celsius sauna. This is because the molecules of water vapor in the sauna are spaced further apart than the water molecules in liquid form. Since the molecules in the thermosphere are so far apart, the radiation of heat is spread out across the surface of the spacecraft, which also radiates heat away from it as well. All in all, the total heat of the thermosphere would not be able to do significant damage to the Apollo spacecraft in the short amount of time it was in the heated upper atmosphere. To protect the astronauts from the Van Allen radiation belts, the lunar module would have required six feet of lead shielding. But here's what they really had for protection. Obviously, the only shielding they had was the literally paper-thin outer hull of aluminum and their suits consisting of glass fiber, some aluminum fibers, and silicon rubber. So I researched this claim about the need for six feet of lead shielding and came up almost empty. As it turns out, this is a conflation of an interstellar starship's capability of providing protection to multiple generations of humans on one space flight, proposed by physicist John Malden, titled Prospects for Interstellar Travel. His assertions of the necessity of six foot of lead protection would be absolutely necessary on a long space flight spanning several generations. However, it would be completely unnecessary to transport a couple of astronauts safely through the relatively small Van Allen radiation belts. I'm not going to get into too much detail about the Van Allen radiation belts, but I will leave you with this. Exposure has to do with the amount of radiation that you are exposed to over a period of time. Many moon hoaxers believe that just because you are exposed to high levels of radiation, your levels of exposure must be high as well. This is simply incorrect. The only part of the Van Allen radiation belts worth mentioning is the inner belt. And not only did they shoot through a portion of the inner belt with less intense radiation levels, but they also passed through at a high velocity in just a few minutes. Therefore, the protection on the outer hull of the Apollo spacecraft was sufficient for the moon missions. Human tissue begins to experience negative effects from radiation at about 500 millisieverts. If we only consider the radiation from alpha particles, there's a conversion of approximately 200 millisieverts sieverts per rad. Therefore, it takes approximately 2.5 rad before experiencing radiation sickness. This NASA chart shows the average rad exposure for the flight crews of each of the Apollo missions, and as you can see, none of the missions were even close to receiving enough radiation to do any real harm. The link to NASA's PDF will be in the description. It's very interesting concerning radiation that the astronauts were protected by a thin film of aluminum when here on Earth they put a lead shield on us when they take a dental x-ray. The answer to this is simple. Radiation intensity decreases at a rate equivalent to the inverse square of the distance. In other words, the closer you are to the source of the radiation, the more intense its radiation is going to be. When taking an x-ray, the radiation source is relatively close. The source of the radiation the astronauts were exposed to on the moon is very far away and traveled a great distance to reach the lunar surface. A lead shield would have just resulted in unnecessary weight and the need to bring additional fuel. In conclusion, when NASA themselves admit to never having left low Earth orbit, and the fact that we don't even have the materials that could withstand the extreme temperatures and cosmic rays in space, how on Earth can anyone believe that we ever went to the moon? The real question is, what kind of person can sit there and deny all the video and photographic evidence combined with third-party verification as if they themselves hold the key to the absolute truth? And as most of you know by now, the answer is a total fucking idiot. Now I'd like to take the time out to thank all of you who made it to the end of this video. Let me know what you think about my first moon hoax debunk video and whether you think I should do more in the future. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to stay current with our daily content and our daily idiot videos will come back tomorrow. I'm Father Skeptic and I'm out. We're trapped in the dome. And what shape is the earth, daddy?